Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 160, which reads as follows. Atahi atano nato, kohi nato parosya. Atanahi sudantena nathang labhati dulabang. Which means, he, indeed, one is one's own refuge. Who indeed could be, who else indeed could be one's refuge, could be a refuge? By one who, a refuge that is hard to obtain is obtained. One obtains a refuge that is hard to obtain. One who tra tames themselves obtains a refuge that is hard to tame. Atan, atanahi sudantena. One who trains themselves, natang labati, dulabang. Very famous verse, actually, among Buddhists. The story is about Kumara Kasapa. It's about his mother, actually. And this is a fairly well-known story in Buddhist circles. So the story goes that this woman was, from, from, from a young age, was keen to become a, a Buddhist nun, a, a bhikkhuni. And as it was common probably with women, it wasn't easy for them to get their parents' permission. Her parents refused to allow her to become uh, a bhikkhuni. And this, the reason for forcing people to get their parents' permission is really just a practical one. It, it, it would lead to great upset of you know, the social order and create problems for the Sangha if it appeared that young people were going off and uh, leaving their families in droves, right? And if, if they were sheltering, you know, children who'd run away from home and that kind of thing. So there's this idea of getting permission uh, from your parents. And she couldn't get it. So instead she got, she, she was married. You know, this unfortunate case for women in, in India at that time, certainly at that time, they didn't have a lot of rights. So instead she was married and went to live with her husband and eventually got his permission. I guess the uh, the idea was that maybe her parents had passed away, but she still needed her parent, her husband's permission because in that society well, it would have, uh, there was this sense of husbands coming and beating up the monks if they let their wives uh, ordain. It actually happened to me once. Uh, we had a woman who uh, wa wanted to, kind of wanted to, to be ordained, and she decided to ordain temporarily, or, or uh, anyway. She ordained, and then her husband came looking for her, and we didn't know she was married. We thought they were engaged, but turns out they were actually married. And he came, and he was ready to, he was ready to beat me up. He was ready to inflict physical punishment. And this was in Sri Lanka, which is a Buddhist country, so well, they were young. But so she desired to, she, she was so intent on it that he, he, you know, and he was, I guess, a nice guy and was keen on it and actually brought her to this monastery in great ceremony and supported her and was quite happy to have his wife become a nun, which is, I think, uh, quite exceptional. But uh, the problem was she was pregnant. When she, 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 she became pregnant, didn't know it, and then became a nun. And so as she was carrying out her monastic duties, her, 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 her body started changing and there was a swelling in her belly. And 
Eventually, the other nun saw it. She couldn't hide it anymore, and the nun saw it, and she said, I'm pregnant. And she said, you know, look, I'm, I'm... And you see the quandary, because nuns have to be celibate. And here was this nun who had become pregnant after some months, they found out, and... Uh, the story gets worse because she was in the monastery of Devadatta. Now, at that time, Devadatta, this cousin of the Buddha who caused so many problems, at that time, I guess, he was, already, he was still a, a, a well-respected monk, and he had his own following, and she was in his monastery. And so the, 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 the other bhikkhunis, they took, him to see, took her to see Devadatta and said, look, here's this bhikkhuni who's apparently broken the celibacy rule, and gotten herself pregnant. And Devadatta took one look at her and said, kick her out, expel her from the order. He was quite, he was, he was uh, afraid for his own reputation, they say. And so the Brikunis were, were ready to get rid of this nun and, and force her to leave the order. Uh, but she said to them, well, I didn't go, I didn't become a nun for the sake of Devadatta. Take me to the Buddha. And they took her to the Buddha, and the Buddha called, uh, called for an investigation. And there's this long story about uh, how they set it up, and it was quite an, quite an experience. You know, here's this woman who's, since she was a young girl, had these obstacles placed in front of her, and finally she becomes a, a nun. She, she attains her goal, and she leaves home and she's ready to devote herself to this life and finds out she's pregnant. And you talk about, remember the, when the Buddha went forth and he thought of his son as a, an impediment. Well, here's a real impediment. And uh, so he called the king, because the Buddha was a patron of the king. He asked, he asked the king to come. He called for Anattapindika and Visaka because these were the two great lay disciples who had great clout and sway in the in the opinions of the people. And and he called Upali. Upali was the monk who was known for the Vinaya. And so he said to Upali, he said, Upali, investigate this matter. And so Upali got the king to come as a witness. And he got Anatta Pindika to come as a witness, and he called Visaka, who was a female. He said, check and see what is the case with this woman. So Visaka called for a curtain to be set up, and they brought this woman behind the curtain, and she examined the woman's body and was able to tell somehow uh, that the, the fetus was old enough that she, she became pregnant well before she ordained. So the story goes. And so she was exonerated, and she was allowed to stay. She gave birth, and then she had to take care as a nun, take care of this baby boy. It's quite a unique situation. I don't know how often this has happened in history. In fact, based on this, they set up a rule that women, if they want to ordain, they have to be celibate, and they have to stay in the monastery celibate for two years. If they don't, they can't ordain, specifically for this reason, because you never know. That's the idea. A lot of technicalities like that. Okay, but where it gets interesting for us is in uh, regards to her son. So her son is called Kumara. Kumara means boy, son. It also means prince. It's a, it's a, it's a word that is used to, to refer to princes. And so what happened is the king was visiting the Buddha once, and he heard the sound of babies, of, of a baby crying, in the nuns' quarters, and he asked about this and found out that this was Kumar, this was Kasapa, this son of the, the bhikkhuni, who had this big proud, big kerfuffle about. And the king thought about this. He said, "Well, that's not really proper. That's you know, for her to have to look after the baby." And he said, you know, "Let me take the, the boy and raise him as a prince." And so he was raised as a prince. Eventually, he found out that his mother was a nun and decided to become a, a monk. He asked permission to become a monk and ended up becoming an arahant. And, but the story goes that 
because this nun was was um, deprived of her child, had, to, had her, her child taken away from him, she had this great, she had cultivated this great affection for him and this great longing, and it prevented her from becoming enlightened herself. Through her, her practice wasn't able to gain, wasn't able to bring fruit because of her intense uh, sadness For her, for her, for the loss of her son, wondering, uh, wondering what happened to her. So she cried a lot. And she was in great distress because she had. I was always thinking about what, what her son, where her son might be, what he might be doing. And I guess she found out that uh, she found out that he became a monk somehow because she saw him once. And. She saw him on Amzard and she ran to meet him. I don't know how that works exactly because if she hadn't seen him before, she must have seen him from time to time or something. At any rate, she knew it was her son and she went up to him and fell at his feet and she was crying. And it says she picked him up and she, or she got up and she hugged her son who was also, who was a monk and because I was thinking to himself, mm, this is, you know, if I, if I respond kindly to this woman, she is going to, it will be, a, it will be an obstacle to her. Now, this is interesting what he says, and this is where the, the verse comes in. He says, if I re respond with kindness, it will be an obstacle to this woman. And therefore I will speak harshly to her. There's something to talk about here. It's not not easy to accept this because he's very harsh with her. He says, "What are you about?" And he says, "Can you not get rid of your your attachment?" As though he, as though she meant nothing to him. And in fact, because he's an arahant, there was not a sense of attachment in his mind. But she was shocked by his behavior, by this sort of uh, lack of emotion on his part. And she shook her head and, and said, for 12 years here, I guess he was just a, um, a novice at that point, for 12 years I've, I've clung to this boy and thought about him, and now he speaks this way to me, it's like, uh, it's like he's a stranger. And realizing this, she, she was able to let go of her attachment and become enlightened. And then the monks get together and they're talking about this. And so this is what we're going to talk about tonight. What does this mean for us? First they're talking about Devadatta. They can't believe that Devadatta was so quick to try and kick this nun out. And that's actually the, converse, the, the uh, cause for a, uh, one of the Jataka stories. There's a Jataka story of two deer. It's a long story. I don't know if I want to go into detail, but basically same thing happens. The, the deer are in a situation where they have to sacrifice, they decide to sacrifice one of them. There are two herds and the king's always out killing them. And because they're getting hit with arrows, that's it. they die a horrible death. So they know they can't escape from the king. So instead they send one, uh, they send one deer, they draw lots and by random chance one deer will have to go and be killed vo voluntarily in the most humane way possible. And it come, becomes this, uh, this one female deer's turn except she's pregnant. And she asks the one deer, you know, please skip me, I'll, I'll take the next turn. I'll take the turn once my baby or babies are born, but please skip me over because it would mean two deaths. It would mean the death of my son or my, my baby. And Devadatta, the, the, the deer, the head deer who's actually to eventually become Devadatta says, no, lots, a lot, your turn. And so she goes to the other deer, the, the head of the other herd, who's the Buddha-to-be, and says the same thing to him. And he says, you don't worry, you go back. Your turn is skipped for this time, this, this, this time. And she goes back, and the head of this, the head of this herd, he, he goes himself. 
anyway, it's a long story. Not really related to our verse, but the one related to our verse is they're, ask, they're talking about this nun and how amazing it is that she was able to uh, give up her, uh, suddenly, just in one moment, realize that she'd had it all wrong. Uh, which is a, actually a common thing with attachment, right? We get attached to an idea more than a reality. Reality is not something you can attach to. We attach to concepts, people. Why, <coughs> why attachment to people is particularly problematic is for this exact reason. We get an idea of them in our minds that's often very, very different from who they actually are. And then when they act in a way that is actually the way they are, uh, it makes us very upset, it shocks us. And then he tells, so he, he, they, 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 they're talking about this and the Buddha says, you know, this, this is someone who's found real refuge. And the idea is that her refuge had been in her son, her, her attachment, her, her uh, affection had been for her son. And so her intention, her, her whole being was bent on this concept, really, of what she thought her son was. And then once she gave that up, she was able to find a true refuge, something that was truly a support for the mind which is Nibbana, of course. So what that means to us, I mean, it's another, it's a good story about affection and how desire becomes an impediment on the path. Uh, but it's controversial about uh, family, right? Not so controversial for, for people who are dedicated Buddhists or meditators, but for people who are coming new to Buddhism or interested in Buddhism, they often find this off-putting about how the Buddha left home, the Bodhisattva left home and left his wife and his son behind. Um, how, and, and a story like this, how this, this is thought to be a virtue, this disregard for the mother's love. Aren't we supposed to love each other? Well, isn't, doesn't Buddhism talk about the, a mother's love and how a mother loves their child and how great that is? Someone pointed that out to me, that, that actually a mother's, a mother's love according to Buddhism isn't all that pure. and It's not exactly um, you know, the, Buddha, the Buddha giving an, an analogy to a mother's love. is not exactly the same as saying we should all love each other like mothers love their children. Because a mother's love for their child, the love part, the kindness, is very pure. But the attachment is very, very impure. And by impure, we just mean it causes suffering. It leads to stress and it leads to suffering. And there are two, so there are two, actually two in unique ideas here that are interesting to us. And one, one is affection and the other is protection. And so we have this word nata. Nata is something that uh, acts as a refuge. Um, but I think both senses are, are appropriate, the sense of a refuge in terms of what the mind uh, finds peace in, in the sense of what it, what it is seeking, or what is it, it is attent upon, what it is dependent upon for happiness. And the other is what it depends upon for, for freedom from suffering, for, for the uh, safety and security. And so this nun wasn't exactly trying to find safety or security. She was, uh, but she had this great dependency on on the affection for her son. And so when when we talk about affection. We have to understand that. From a Buddhist point of view, we're, we're trying to look at, not be too cliché, the bigger picture. We're looking at things from a point of view of ultimate reality. And I mean, the real problem is that we get caught up in conceptual reality. We're, we're taught from birth all sorts of concepts that turn out to be 
situational. And we're, we confuse the situational with the ultimate. I mean, a situational truth is that I'm a man, I'm a monk. Situational truth is, is that uh, you have to drive on the right side of the road, that uh, the sky is blue, you have to respect your parents, that we even have parents. This is situational truth. Uh, and some of these truths are related to wholesomeness. You know, giving is good. That's a situ that's a, I mean, these are conventional truths, but sometimes our, well, much of our reality is just conventional. Much of it is just cultural. You know, like a good, a really good example is recently we had this conversation about uh, respect in the monastery, and there was this question, and this question has come up before about whether we should have rules for, say, dress. Um, you know, the, one of the questions should people be able to wear shorts and a tank top when they come to the monastery? But another one was. Um, should we tell people not to point their feet at the Buddha? Uh, because in Thailand, this is a big thing. You, you never ever point your feet at anyone, let alone the Buddha statue. So when you're sitting in a monastery, it's greatest disrespect to point your feet. But I said, well, in Sri Lanka, everyone points their feet at the Buddha and they, they, their feet at the Buddha, and they have no sense of disrespect. And people get, Thai people get very outraged, uh, thinking that this is somehow meaningful. When when foreigners come and they put they point their feet at the Buddha, they should they should they should all see how the Sri Lankan people sit. But it's a good example because we get outraged about things, or we get attached about attached to things. So when you hear about this son who disregards his mother, and when you when you have the, see the appearance that uh, fam familial uh, relations are disregarded, that it was actually a good thing for this son to be, to disregard his mother's affection. You have to understand what, what, what's really going on, you know, what, and what are we really, what, what are we really looking for? You know, from a Buddhist point of view, it, you can't truly be happy with any kind of attachment. So uh, our, our ordinary understanding of how to find happiness is flawed. We try to find happiness in people, in places, in things, in possessions, in stimulus, in, uh, in the chemicals in our brain, really, that provide pleasurable experiences. And we think of that as happiness. We, we think we're happy. We think this is bringing us happiness, or it would if we could just get it right. And eventually we end up settling for pleasure and pain coming and going. This, um, this ends up being our refuge, right? And uh, we have this sense that the world is somehow a stable place. We, we create this stability in our lives. We have as our refuge our families, our possessions, our jobs, our money, our societies, everything is a refuge for us. And then, and then disaster strikes, change comes, and we suffer. You know, if you look at how things are going in the world today with natural disasters, I mean, a natural disaster is a really good example. The point being, not that we can all expect natural disasters, but that when you look at this, when you look at people who undergo a natural disaster, or when you look at people who undergo change or loss, when you look at this woman who spent 12 years crying about her son, it's really hard to support the idea that this is actually the, something that is truly happiness. 
in the short term, this kind of stability is, is clearly happiness for as long as it lasts. But anyone who is discriminatory, discriminating means someone who, who, who has any sort of wisdom. When they reflect on this and look at the results, like this woman did, this nun did, this bhikkhuni did, she looked at the results of her attachment, the results of these years and years and how, how painful it was for her to finally be disabused of her, her illusion of her son. To have, to have this concept of her son changed, right? Like when your house burns down, the concept of your house has suddenly changed. How you conceive of your house is no longer as a refuge, but a pile of burning rubble. When a hurricane comes, when a flood comes, when the concepts no longer are supported by reality, then we suffer. And anyone who looks at this can, can't help but notice the problem with attachment, that there's an incredible build-up of, of uh, dependency. And so when we talk about refuge, the things we're dependent upon generally are not a refuge for us. They're not stable. They're not satisfying. You know, and mostly it doesn't take a natural disaster. Mostly we go through this on a daily basis. We want things to be a certain way, and they aren't that way. We have a conception of, of how things are, and we're disappointed, or we are... Um, when things don't go our way, we, we are at a loss. And really it all comes because of lack of understanding. I mean, this is what the importance of meditation is, that when you study reality uh, intensively and consistently, you start to lose this, this disconnect between how things appear to be and how they actually are. So when you're looking at ultimate reality, you, can, you have no sense of sons or mothers or that kind of thing you have, you have no you, you you take things as they are when the son was confronted by his mother he took it as it was here was a person who was setting themselves up for great disappointment and if he had coddled her and gone along with her and and said oh yes i'm your son I, you know, she would continue to to pine away and 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 worry about him, care about him, and she would never be able to f be present and be mindful. And eventually she would suffer anyway when, she, when he died, when she died, when, you know, when she had to leave. Well, she was suffering constantly because she couldn't be around him. I think family is a very difficult one for people to appreciate. Uh, to appreciate the the nature of the attachment, how the attachment causes suffering. But the the bigger picture here is about refuge. We try to take refuge in our family. I mean, that's a, a real reason for ta telling this verse now is to remind us about how family is seen as a refuge. And family is probably the the hardest for for many people. It's the hardest refuge to let go of to see that it's not actually a refuge. And for some people, family is not a refuge. But for those who it is, the realization that you, one is one's own refuge, that no one else can really be there for you when we rely on our parents. You know, this is the whole idea of protection. When we get in trouble, one of the first things we do is think of our parents and how they, they can save us, how they can protect us. And of course, this is the idea is that this is a misconception. That our reliance on other people is really what causes us stress and suffering. You know, because we depend on things that are not dependable. You know, other people can't always be there for us. And even when they are there for us, uh, what we're talking about, they, is just a concept. The reality is our experience, and our experience is dependent on our own habits and our own reactions and our own interactions. So 
So no, no one but ourselves can free us and, and keep us from suffering. And again, the Buddha talks here about one who tames oneself. This whole, uh, the last verse as well, but we're talking about people who tame themselves, people who train themselves. Train us to see through this, this, this attachment, this um, wrong attribution where we think of people, we think of places, we think of things as being a refuge. It's very easy to be lulled into a false sense of security. And all the time, you're increasing and you're cultivating your, your, your dependency on things. The more stable things are, the more dangerous it is. When, when things change, you're, you're more at a loss. Right? Because the habit that you're cultivating is a dependency on this way. If, if I live in this same house for a long time, I'll start to get comfortable in this house. And, uh, and, and comfortable in a specific situation. And the more, I, de the more I, I, I depend on this one situation, the harder it's going to be when I have to, when I have to leave. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of when I die. When a person dies, then if they've had a, a cultivated a sense of flexibility, um, it's much easier for them to move on. They get mu much less panic at the moment of death. But the same goes with this life. And so this is, in our meditation, we hope to, to break through, first of all, our dependency on, on concepts, people, places, and things, and see things based on experience. Um, but, but also, uh, an important aspect of that is becoming flexible. Because when you're forced to focus on reality, you see that reality is constantly changing, that it's not satisfying, that it's not under our control. And the um, re result of this sort of observation on the mind is that you, you, you stop clinging, you stop looking for refuge, you stop becoming um, complacent, and you are prepared and, and able to stay at peace when things change, even when your whole reality changes, even at the moment of death. That through being mindful, even in the face of difficulty, even when, when meditation is not pleasant, through being patient and becoming uh, flexible, you know, that now my experience is like this and, and keeping up with it, and cultivating a state of mind that is impervious to change. Yeah. You, you create a real refuge, and you free yourself from the potential suffering uh, of trying to be, find refuge in things that can't protect you, things that can't, that can't um, gratify your desires. That's the most, uh, most valuable refuge. And the Buddha says it's difficult to gain, indeed, impossible if someone isn't actually trying to see things as they are, isn't actually cultivating mental development. But even for those of our, who are, they can see how difficult this is. It's difficult to be flexible, it's difficult to be present. Our minds are constantly wanting to cling, wanting to uh, depend upon something else. We don't want to be our minds don't want to be mindful. So, some thoughts. How to find a refuge for yourself. In the practice of mindfulness, we learn to become flexible and we give up our attachments. Which, when we see that our attachments in the long term, even in the short term, don't actually satisfy us. They only create dependency and eventual dissatisfaction and a constant stress as we worry and, and concern ourselves about the things we're attached to, which is what this fi woman, fin this mother of, of Kumara Kasipa, finally realized. And she found for herself a true refuge. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in.